Hello, and welcome back to James and the Frames. I'm your host, James, and here I talk about some of my favorite frames ever filmed. We have now officially entered October. Finally! We're going into the autumn season. October this month is absolutely packed with super cool new releases that I'm super excited to check out. But it also means a a new season, autumn. It's one of my favorite seasons of the year. I'm describing Autumn like one of my favorite films. It's one of my favorites of all time. The performances are amazing. The cinematography is incredible. Autumn is just a top tier. Five out of five. Just one best picture for like ten years in a row for me. So with Autumn, of course, comes autumnal films. And it just so happens that a film I posted about a couple weeks ago, Mommy, is just that. This film, I think, would be the perfect way to kick off October on the podcast, so I'm going to talk about it, and I'm going to talk about it in depth. There will be a short little spoiler-free review, as I always give at the beginning, but then I'll get into more spoiler-filled territory. So, let us begin with uh, the synopsis, and the synopsis, I'm going to try and do it off the top of my head. I don't really want to go just from IMDb or, or any other place where the synopsis is located, so... The film revolves around a young lad named Steve, his mother Di, or Diana, and uh, her friend Kyla. Or Kyla, yeah, I guess Kyla would be the name to say it. The story revolves mostly around Di and and her son, but also around the three characters, and it shows um, their attempts to not cure Steve, but to make him better. And there's an impending case, an impending event that could cause Steve to go away for a very long time into a mental institution. And in the beginning of the film, there's actually a line of text that describes this new dystopian law that the government can have possession over a child if it is not, I don't want to say fit for society, but if it's uh, out of control and um, mentally ill, they have the will to take it from a parent's arms. I think Pretty sure that's an accurate description of what happens. Um, don't think I left anything too important out there. Oh, and the fact that, of course, Steve is a bit, a little bit of a basket case. He gets into trouble a lot, and he's very uh, ADHD. So that's a huge factor. I, I think I left out, but you guys get the main idea. I thought it was amazing. I really loved it. It's it's not a film I want to rewatch anytime soon. It's a lot to digest. There are some very hard scenes to watch in this film, but the way it's presented is the shining factor. And the performances are incredible by everyone, most importantly Steve and Di's actors. Main characters in this film are so fleshed out that they feel like real people, and I'll get to that point later as well, but it really doesn't feel like a screenplay was written. kind of feels like uh, everybody improvised in front of the camera, which is not the case because there's a physical script out there, but... It's that natural. And of course, as I mentioned before, this film is definitely a great one to start Autumn off with. If you're looking for an Autumn watch list, include it in your Autumn watch list. It's it's really interesting how the use of autumnal colors in this film contrasts the film's subject matter, which is incredibly dark and depressing. And... There's these oranges and yellows and bright, vibrant colors that that, that contrast those feelings, and I think it's done really well. Mommy is a great pick for Autumn. And those are my spoiler-free thoughts on it. So, spoiler discussion beginning. I'm really baffled by how well this film handled its its subject matter. It's executed to a T. I think the mother-son dynamic is done brilliantly as well as the whole character journey the son goes on, Steve. Of course, I'll, I'll get right to the crux of the biscuit in this review and talk about the Wonderwall montage scene, which is one of the most talked about scenes in the film. It's been featured on a lot of uh, top 10s of 2010s list, and I've, I've actually, I'm guilty to admit that I've seen uh, the whole sequence of him pulling back the aspect ratio bars. And luckily enough, it was hazy enough in my memory for it to be impactful when I saw it for the first time. And I don't think a change of aspect ratio has impacted me more than Mommy's change in aspect ratio. 
Although, if so, for example, in, in Wes Anderson's The Grand Budapest Hotel, he obviously switches through time periods using different aspect ratios, and that adds to the style of the film. But I wouldn't really say too much to its emotional um, substance, and Mommy does both of those things. I think the way everything is framed, most characters are framed in the middle during the whole one by one or one by one one. I forgot the aspect exact aspect ratio. It's not four by three. It's it's even older than four by three. The way that aspect ratio is used, the way it's framed, I think it's absolutely gorgeous. And of course, when the bars pull back for the first time, those bars on either side, they're not just there for for show. Obviously, as we see. They kind of represent Steve and and Di's um, inner psyche and their inner turmoil, and we see how Steve kind of pulls the bars back. It's like for for once in the film he's free at that moment because up until that point, I feel like he felt trapped maybe with his own issues, with his own personal issues, and finally meeting that new someone and and opening up more makes him sort of push those those bars, those restraining bars um, off of himself. And I think that's a great metaphor also to how he was, quote-unquote, locked up in a mental facility. I feel like his mind was still somewhere lingering there up until that montage. And for Dai's uh, perspective, I think she feels almost trapped with her son in a way because it's very obvious that throughout the film, uh, when she's with him, He's sometimes a burden, like his presence is sometimes a burden on her because he either throws a tantrum or or does inappropriate things or just has loud outbursts. And he's always a constant weight on her and a constant, not annoyance, but disturbance is, is more of the word. And what's really beautiful about it all is that at the end of the day, she still loves him and still cares about him enough to, to send him to get help and, well, obviously try to help him. So at that moment for that montage... I think it's more oriented towards Steve and his psyche. And, well, we can see Di, that she's super happy. Actually, I contradict myself because at the end of the montage, when the bars start closing in, uh, when Di is served at the door, the bars start closing in again. So the montage starts off of Steve opening, or the bars start opening with Steve and they close back with Di. So I think maybe at that point is when the film kind of shifts more to Dai's perspective. Because up until that point, I think it was more oriented towards um, towards Steve pers- Steve's perspective. And I think that's a great tonal shift also. And of course, it also means a great deal in terms of um, the impact it has on the audience. I felt very claustrophobic, of course, and very uncomfortable for like the first 15, 10 to 15 minutes of the film because the aspect ratio was so largely different than most films. It kind of gives you an insight into how the characters feel on screen. And when Steve pushes those bars aside, the audience gets a breather for a second also. It's not just the characters. And I think that's a great double double whammy there. That's what I mean when I say I don't think an aspect ratio has affected me that well. It's because not just for, for the story on screen, but for the effect it has on the audience. There's only two instances in, in the film in which it's used. And that's the... Um, the first montage scene with uh, Wonderwall by Oasis, which actually, side note, not one of my favorite songs, but after hearing it in this film, I, I can kind of guess how important it was to the film and uh, the lyrics, m- more importantly, how they kind of relate to what's happening. Like, I don't believe that anybody feels the way I do about you now. Like, that's probably how Steve feels towards his mom and her friend and probably vice versa. So those lyrics are are pretty impactful, and I, 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 I can get behind that. I just haven't had the best memories with Wonderwall by Oasis. A long time ago, I used to work um, at a restaurant. They used to play that song all the time. And yeah, for the first couple of weeks, it's all, it was all right. But the whole summer, glad this film changed my perspective on it a little bit. I now associate it with this film and not with memories of working at a restaurant. So congratulations, Xavier Dolan. You've you've done your job well. And speaking of Xavier Dolan, he wrote and directed this film, I believe, when he was only 25, which is an incredible feat. And I'm also aware that one of his earlier films screened alongside Denis Villeneuve's Polytechnique and won. 
which was then considered like a like a huge upset at the, at the festival and everybody was like well, how does how does this kid win over Denis Villeneuve and like stuff like that so it, i think that's a pretty cool connection and um i'm surprised how young he was to have, to have been directing this and i mean hey maybe yours truly could attempt to do something like that in in a year or two <clears throat> teasers aside um Xavier Dolan directs the hell out of this and I really believe that he got everything he wanted um, for this production. I, f- I believe he was pr- in full control of of every aspect, and he got what, what, what he needed. Well, of course, the cinematography is gorgeous, how everything's framed and how everything's colored and, and lit. There are very few scenes that have like a, like a negative or sour color palette. Mostly everything is, is bright and vibrant, and I think that's a great contrast to, obviously, what what's going on in the, in the film story. One of the best instances where this is shown is the second montage scene. In the second montage scene, which I like to call Die's Dream, it starts playing out with um, Ludovico Ainaudi's, um experience, which is a very compelling and heartbreaking piece that, uh, fun fact, actually, Xavier Dolan actually based a short film or a short script off of experience and wanted to make a story about a mother and a son and a mother's desperate and and almost hopeless dreams for her son's future that could never come true. And I don't know if this is completely on the dot, but I think he wrote Mommy from there. And I think that's pretty cool. And it's cool to see where the heart of this film is, which is ultimately Di and Steve and what Di wants for Steve, and how Steve feels about Di. I think the montage showcases their relationship really well. I feel like this is the last breath of fresh air uh, in the film before it takes it away from you. Using the full frame for this dreamlike sequence, once again, it makes the audience breathe, but it also lifts a huge weight off of Di as she as she has a moment of, of, of hopefulness and imagines a perfect future. And for a second there, we're in there with her, but then the bars start closing in again, and we get to the film's ending, which is a good one. It was a bit bleak, but it was also an open ending, and longtime listeners of the podcast know that I'm a very fond fan of open endings. I think it's the most respectful thing a filmmaker can do to an audience member to sort of, in a way, pass the story baton onto you and ask, what do you think happens? And let you kind of craft your own story from there. And I think that's something beautiful. And I'm, this won't be the last time I mention that, my, my take on the open ending, but um, that's what I feel like. One of the best films that ever did that for me was Prisoners and Inception, those two. Great open endings. And Mommy is is, is no exception. Uh, we see Steve running for the window at the very end, and we're unsure if he's to escape or not. And if we're continuing with the bleak nature of the film, I don't think he does escape. I don't think it was in anybody's head either that he got away. I think he just broke free and started running and then they catch him pretty easily because they already caught him before when they caught him the first time of course the film has its fair share of heartbreaking scenes but there are also some very intense scenes there's the argument scene uh near the beginning uh where steve gets gets dyed this this necklace and they have this whole fight about it i think it's um it's also one of the more popular scenes of the film i've seen it shared a lot and it's a really great intense scene. It's very well acted, and that's the that's the best description I can give, actually, of this whole film. It's that everything is paced very naturally, and there isn't a sense that there's any script or screenplay in here because the way the characters are performed and the way they interact, it just feels like we're a fly on the wall. And that's what I really love in a film when it's so documentary-like to where these characters could be like real people you could find in the street. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so into Sean Baker's filmography now. And of course, Noah Baumbach, to some extent, writes his characters very well in that regard. 
having more of that new wave approach. I'm I'm a fan of it. I really enjoy it. And I really enjoyed Mommy. And in terms of anything else to talk about, I think I've said everything that I've that I've wanted to say about it. I think it's a brilliantly made film. It's definitely in my top uh, 10 or 15 of 2014. Not that I have a specific dedicated list, or, nor do I rank one film above the other. Usually in my lists, I kind of just compile them together, and whatever's the first one is the first one. It really makes no difference to me, except with my 2013 list. That might be a bit different, because um, there's a lot of good films that came out in 2013, too. So, Mommy was great, and... While we're on the subject of, of Sean Baker, of course, I actually, right before recording this, I just saw the first trailer for Red Rocket, which is a new film coming out this year. I'm excited to see it. Well, of course, I absolutely love the Florida Project, as you guys can tell on my Instagram post. He actually shared it to his story, which was pretty cool. Um, so, Sean, if you're somehow listening, thanks, man. It means a whole deal. I can't wait to see Red Rocket. I don't know the main actor. I don't know any of the actors in the film, actually, so... It'll be an interesting one to see. I love how the actors in, in Red Rocket kind of look like real people. They don't look like movie stars, quote-unquote. And same thing goes for the Licorice Pizza trailer. New Paul Thomas Anderson film, too. The last half of this year, guys, it's going to be insane. <laughs> we have Sean Baker. We have freaking Denis Villeneuve with, with Dune. We have Edgar Wright with Last Night in Soho. We have Pablo Lorraine with, with Spencer. We have Paul Thomas Anderson with Licorice Pizza. It's going to be a great last half of the year. And as I was saying about Licorice Pizza, of course, the characters in the trailer, they don't look like movie stars. They just look like normal folk. I guess maybe with Sean Penn or, or Bradley Cooper, you could see through that. But even, even, even those guys, they look very down to earth. And it's difficult nowadays to see a film with a leading character, or someone in a lead role or a supporting role, that doesn't look like a chiseled, like super, like not even like clean shaven, like movie star. Like in this film, I can see characters have like pimples, they have beards, they have like wrinkly features. They look a lot more normal, and that's something that I'm just excited about. And of course, Cooper Hoffman will be playing a supporting or, or co, co-leading role or leading role in the film. I'm not quite sure what his role is yet. It's, I think in the trailer it's established that he's a big part of it. And I'm excited to see the son of, of, of Philip Seymour Hoffman collaborating with, with Paul Thomas Anderson. I think that's a really touching, I, I don't want to say tribute, but a really touching way to, to carry on the, the Hoffman name. And he looks great. I think he's going to do amazing and Paul Thomas Anderson is going back to his roots also. It's been a while since we've seen a film from him that has taken place in, in, in Los Angeles and where Magnolia and Boogie Nights took place. It's been a while since we've seen that, so I'm excited to see him go back to his roots there. And the soundtrack is definitely going to be a banger too, because if we already heard Bowie in the trailer, you bet that we'll be hearing more of... Uh, those 70s hits. So I'm excited to see Licorice Pizza. Uh, this is now turned into, once again, the James is excited about the last part of 2021 segment of the podcast. Dune is almost here. Tickets are now on sale. People are getting their spots. I'm getting my spot in the theater to go see this, this, this behemoth of a blockbuster that looks to redefine everything that a blockbuster is. So my Dune hype is through the roof. I also finished reading the first half of the book, and I believe the film covers the first half of the book, if not a little more. So I'm I'm tempted to continue reading for a little more, lest I lose any details in the film, but I'm also kind of hesitant, because even if they show a little bit of book two off, I can just hop right into the book and continue the story. Either way, I'll I'll probably just end up reading uh, the rest of the book anyway, because it's such a captivating novel and I can't believe it was written over 50 years ago it's amazing how much it stands the test of time so yeah dune hype licorice pizza hype red rocket hype and also embers hype um shout out to to bruce on the dance of cinema I got a chance to see his film embers 
an early screener. He really knocks it out of the park. It's my favorite short of his, and I believe it's the best one he's done. It, it, it combines everything from his past shorts, throws it and sautés it in this beautiful mix of, of colors, music, and performance. Definitely check it out when it releases on November 15th. We are almost a month away, so I'm super happy for him. Bruce, he did an amazing job, and I am definitely going to watch it again once it comes out. The last half of this year is just going to be incredible. And a quick side note, I will actually be going to the San Diego International Film Festival. I will be attending it with uh, the review website I write for, Film Snob Reviews. Um, We will be there. I will be seeing Come On, Come On, the new Mike Mills film with Joaquin Phoenix, which looks amazing. I love the black and white cinematography already, and I love the aesthetic. I'm excited to check it out. I'll be also seeing Spencer, of course. That's one of my most anticipated of the year as well. I just saw Jackie the other day, and I was absolutely blown away. So I can't wait to see what Pablo Rain does with the complex and profound character of Princess Diana, played by Kristen Stewart, who, hey, everyone, another actor who has had an amazing comeback after severe media backlash. Kristen Stewart looks absolutely phenomenal, and I can't wait to see her. I will also be checking out The French Dispatch. The French Dispatch, probably the week it releases in theaters, if not a little earlier, I'm excited to see it. Wes Anderson returning to live action after a few years now. Last time he released a live action film, it was in 2014, Grand Budapest Hotel, so it's been a while. I Maybe he did a short in between, I don't recall, but it's been a while, so I'm hyped. And as for Halloween, of course, I will be thinking uh, during these few days, I'll be thinking about which film to do a Halloween special on. I'm excited for all the horror elements that come into play in the later half of this month. So stay tuned for some uh, spicy, spooky, Halloween-y reviews coming up on the Instagrams and the YouTubes, and just stay tuned for that. And with all that, I think uh, I think this concludes the first episode of James in the Frames for October. We're going into autumn, folks. It's going to be a great last half of the year. I'm super excited. I'm going to be covering so much. And I can't wait to share it all with you guys. And, uh, yeah, let me know what you guys thought of Mommy. Let me know what anticipated films you're looking forward to this October. I'm probably going to do a post on Instagram of what my most anticipated are for, for October and for the rest of the year. So stay tuned for that as well. And, yeah, for now, this has been another episode of James in the Frames. And I will see you after the credits.